welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 6 of the Mad in America podcast. Thank you so much for getting in touch and sharing your thoughts, feedback and comments with me. If you'd like to discuss the podcast, you can now visit madinamerica.com forward slash forums. This week we have an interview with Dr. Pratima Singh. Dr. Singh completed her medical degree in India before moving to the UK to work at the Maudsley NHS Hospital in London as an adult psychiatrist. Dr. Singh has a deep interest in alternatives to biological approaches to psychiatry and the use of psychotropic medications. I was keen to ask Dr. Singh about her own background, what led her towards psychiatry as a medical specialty, and what she feels about the future of psychiatric care. Dr. Singh, thank you so much for talking with me today. To begin, I just wanted to ask a bit about your background and what it was that led you towards psychiatry. Um, First of all, James, thank you so much for inviting me to speak uh, on the podcast. I'm I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity because I think this allows me to talk about something I feel very passionately about. And I'm trying my best to, uh, you know, Uh, spread uh, the word. So, I mean, about me, uh, so I originally come from India where I did my um, medical uh, degree. And um, while I was there, I think it became, um, you know, apparent very quickly that I was naturally attracted to um, psychiatry as well as, I mean, luckily psychiatry liked me as well. So I got a lot of positive feedback from uh, my supervisors that, you know, what I was really good at is, you know, sitting down with people and having conversations that, you know, maybe some other doctors found uh, difficult or avoided. Um, so I think that's that what started it. But I was also very fortunate to have a mentor who who really influenced my interest in a, a more scientific way in this uh, field and you know really got me interested in the psychopathology about you know how how people start to develop these uh, different state of minds and in times of crisis so that is what started it off but i i guess my departure from india was uh, due to a particular Uh, reason. And that was, I I always felt quite uncomfortable about how biological uh, psychiatry was in India. So Mm -hmm. medication was heavily used. And I mean, if you keep in mind circumstances in a developing country, you know, that's that's not surprising. We have very few resources for psychotherapy even today, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I left India about 15 years ago. And, um, you know, the area of uh, research and mental health um, was still quite uh, in its nascent stages. So although we had a few premier institutes in India, um, the mainstream psychiatry training was very biological. And I I think I didn't want that. I was very interested in psychotherapy and about what I was reading. Um, So that's what um, attracted me to Europe and actually to Maudsley in particular, because that was the only name I knew. And I, I was very lucky to be supported by my mentor in uh, this journey Mm. and you know after being here um, things were pretty straightforward for me because it's a speciality that has great difficulty in recruiting which for me meant that I, I had no difficulty entering the profession but on the flip side I found myself uh, surrounded by people for whom this speciality was not the first choice and I think that that again was quite difficult for the few of us who were in this speciality because we felt passionate and it, it was not a, a default choice because we, uh, you know, there was difficulty in getting into other fields. And I think that that created interesting obstacles in the journey. But, um, you know, 15 years uh, in the Western medical system working in mental health has given me a much more nuanced and I, I would say a humble uh, appreciation of how how things worked back in India that I took uh, for granted. So, for example, you know, just appreciating the advantage of a less individualistic society and uh, importance of strong family uh, structures or, uh, you know, the uh, contemplative practices like prayer or meditation or yoga within the culture. You know, these were the things I did not appreciate when I was there and when I left uh, India. And then coming here and seeing how we are making so much more of an effort to 
kind of integrate this into a modern lifestyle has been really interesting. So I, I continued my training, but I, you know, I was very fortunate. I did my training in charring cross rotation and then uh, the Maudsley rotation. And I think overall, although I would say the training was excellent, like, you know, my, my discontentment about uh, the biological approach continued. Um, and I think it has led to me to be uh, here where I am. So I currently work as a community psychiatrist yeah. um, in um, in one of the most deprived boroughs of uh, London. And um, I see patients who are first uh, referred to secondary mental health services. So I see them quite early on in their journey. Mm. And I, I feel really privileged that I get to de- do what I do. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And could you help me understand broadly how psychiatric services in the UK work to support those with mental health difficulties and perhaps your experience of how that has changed in recent times? Um, so, as I said earlier, uh, James, so uh, you know, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the majority of mental health problems or difficulties is actually taken care of in the primary care. So, it's our GPs who are dealing with the maximum burden of mental health problems up to uh, about 80 percent. And I think with inclusion of the IACT, which is integrated access to psychological therapies in the recent years, you know, what used to be, um, you know, just GPs, um, they now have access to uh, talking treatments. And I think that that has been uh, a huge progress. Um, so anything that is not within the realm of primary care is then uh, looked after in um, secondary care. So secondary care structures have evolved. So there has been a big shift from the large um, you know, kind of institutions or old uh, style asylums to more community based cares. And um, this has evolved uh, from you know the old style uh, community mental health team or CMHTs in short. Um, where patients are, you know, kind of looked after by a team that consists of you know, uh, care coordinators that might, who might be you know, nurses, social workers, occupational therapists. They have psychiatrists, and the idea was that you know these care coordinators would develop a relationship and have you know kind of deal with the patient um, in a way that, you know, forges a relationship and gives opportunity um, to focus on whatever the need uh, might be. And so sometimes it could be about medication, but many other times it can be very practical aspects of what they are struggling in their uh, life or things that ha- have happened a long time ago that are you know, kind of repeating in uh, a sort of a pattern that might require more um, psychological uh, attention and uh, therapy. So that that used to be the CMHT. And then we have the acute care or, uh, you know, kind of crisis uh, care, which includes the inpatient beds or people seen in crisis in any where there might or might not be a psychiatry liaison service. So this is a small team of mental health workers who support uh, the a e staff in dealing with a psychiatric uh, crisis. Mm. And then there is also a home treatment team or um, the crisis resolution team, as it's called in some parts of the country, where uh, the hope is that you know patients are treated in, um, in the most suitable setting, which for many patients might be their own home rather than um, a ward that can be quite acutely disturbed. So the home treatment team were brought in as an alternative to hospital uh, admissions so that people would have an opportunity if needed to have an alternative to hospital uh, care. And then I think based on a patient's specific needs, there has been diversification into more specialist services for learning disability, neuropsychiatry, eating disorder. And I think these are very varied throughout the country, depending on the size of the trust, what resources they have, and importantly, what they are commissioned uh, to do. And um, so I think focusing on how community care has changed um, uh, in recent uh, times. So like any good thing gone too far, um, we have drastically and too rapidly cut down inpatient beds. So I think the number is around 20,000 acute inpatient psychiatric beds have uh, been cut down over the past few decades. Mm. And this has not really translated into uh, complementary uh, 
development of community services. So, so I think we are left. Uh, we are left with a huge gap. Uh, so we now have community mental health teams that are looking after more and more uh, people. Um, but we are also kind of uh, expected to look after people at, at the, until points where it might not be safe to do uh, so. And um, this pressure, this this focus to uh, has been mainly to reduce cost. And so th that definitely has been a gradual and consistent dense investment in mental health services. And so we have community mental health teams that now are starting to reconfigure so that they can do more with less resources, which means that it stops having this long-term focus and starts to look more like an acute care model where you are expected to see people quickly, do stuff quickly, and then discharge them uh, quickly. So in practice, you know, just because there's a model does not mean that this is how it would work. In practice, what happens is that people's need are chronic, even though they are, might present in an acute crisis or they might present what seems on surface like, a, you know, not a very severe problem, might have roots that go down sometimes back to their childhood uh, traumas or things that have happened in their family, like loss of a loved one or loss uh, of employment um, or start of a, a psychotic illness. You know, so things that might look like they can be dealt with quickly, but actually require a lot of time and relationship. We have really struggled to do that in 12 uh, weeks. Our patients routinely now uh, remain with uh, in our team uh, over six months, sometimes even over a year. And there is a bottleneck to transfer these patients to the long-term uh, teams, who, which are slightly better resourced um, to look after people uh, this way. But at the same time, they are already full uh, because of um, the idiosyncrasies of the path uh, way. So I think the main impact and the main change in the recent times has been the constant pressure from commissioners and rapid service reconfigurations mean that the contacts are more and more brief, mm. which means that the people who actually end up in the acute pathway or actually end up in the inpatient beds are definitely more unwell than they would have been uh, if the intervention would have been more uh, timely. So the pressure is passed on to every part of the system. And I think if there are, if people are more unwell at admission, they remain in uh, there for a longer period of time. They have more disruption of their lives. They take longer to get better and uh, be uh, discharged. And the sicker you are, I think that that has a prognostic, so that has an impact on how well you do uh, in the longer term. I can see that those financial pressures are working against the model of socially based community support that we want, aren't they? And I also wonder if that's one of the reasons why medication is so heavily relied on, because it's a relatively quick and cheap intervention, and that can be tempting when viewed through an economic lens. Absolutely. And I think these things happen at quite a covert level. And you are absolutely right. So, I mean, 10 years ago, when I was a, a, a trainee in a community mental health team, compared to that, um, you, you know, that it's mind boggling. So I would say 99% of the patients I see in my community team now come with uh, uh, from the GP already on medication. And often they have already been on one, sometimes two medication, even before they arrive to uh, secondary mental um, health care. I think so what that means by definition is that, you know, many people are arriving in the so-called treatment resistant phase. So they have tried at least two medications. You know, sometimes these trials are not adequate. They're not at adequate doses or they're not long enough, but they've had input from IAP, CPT. So they are, they are definitely arriving, um, having tried medication, in my opinion, a bit too early. Mm -hmm. And this is not to say that this is a problem for every patient. I mean, you, uh, I definitely would be lying if I said that I do not come across people who say that medication has benefited them. But I would say that a majority, a majority of the patients who I'm asked to see 
I'm asked to see because medication isn't helping. Mm -hmm. And when I do a timeline, so that's one thing I do for every patient is that I make a timeline of their life rather than look at what happened in the preceding six weeks and what what is the dose uh, of the medication that can be tinkered with. When you do a timeline, it certainly feels like there are clues right along their history about things that have created the imbalance, you know, maybe in terms of their relationship or how they have been living their life or what choices they have been uh, uh, making and why they are doing that. And I think that kind of reflection takes time um, because I don't think it's a easy thing to do uh, as a patient that uh, you know you can open up that way. Um, it's much easier to engage with a professional sometimes at the level of uh, medication. But I must say that the other thing that strikes me that I'm, I see more and more patients who will come to me and say that they do not want to try medication. And in terms of my training, my training did not prepare me well. Uh, so nobody said that when a patient says this, you say this. But I think what you observe when you are a, a trainee is that you you are you are covertly trained to convince people about benefits and when 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 we look at the evidence and uh, the strength of the evidence not only the evidence but this actually the extent and the strength of it it's quite weak i mean we don't have grounds to persuade our patients to take medication as strongly as we do so i mean why are we doing it is an interesting question and as you say i think the system plays a role mm. i think if you are forced into um, uh, a system where uh, you have an acute care mindset, then you will respond with things where you you you'll be seen as doing something. So you know, writing a prescription um, is is a concrete example of uh, something. Hell, and you send away the patient with a promise, but possibly not having that much discussion about everything. Uh, that it entails to be on um, psychotropic uh, medication. So you play down the risk. You do not have the discussion about the full extent of the side effects. Yeah, so, and and I think patients know that. Patients know that. Uh, and uh, But I think for some patients, it can be really problematic to end up on medication that they no longer find useful, but they have great difficulties coming off. Uh, as well. It's a message that I've heard loud and clear, but I've also heard people say that they almost feel they've failed if they don't get a prescription after a consultation with a GP. So we as patients have a role to play too, don't we? It's very interesting also to hear that you felt that your training prepared you well to communicate the benefits of the medications, but you weren't necessarily as prepared when a patient said they didn't want the medications and asked what the options were. So, um, uh, James, I, I think it's an interesting point about, you know, so uh, that we are all possibly party to this uh, mindset that we have created. But I think, again, in from a systemic point of view, when we approach medication as the first solution to any health problem, I mean, leave alone mental health. Mm. I mean, if we look at pain uh uh, for example, if that is our approach, I think we propagate we propagate this delusion that you know almost everything can be fixed by taking a pill. So you know the a pill for every ill concept. So I think that that is how our patients in their sixties end up with medication as long as uh, there are, which then you know lead to more side effects and then medication to treat those side effects. So I think. It's a problem in every speciality, but I think it's a bigger problem in mental health because of the nature of medication. And like I said, combined with the ignorance on professionals' part about how these medication behave and how unexpected it is. So as a psychiatrist, I cannot predict. I don't have any test. I don't ha do not have any uh, substantial means to predict how a person would react to a medication, what side effects they would get, and how easy or difficult it will be for them to come off the medication. And every time I've had this conversation with a person who is willing to have that conversation, they have made a choice to try other things before medication. And I think the same needs to happen at the level of the GP when somebody comes with pain. I think we need to tell them that, you know, you are taking this opioid and you will feel fantastic, but there is a chance that you will, you know, get addicted. And I think, you know, it's not a great example because I think that already happens to some extent. But I think that does not happen with mental uh, health as much as it needs to. I agree. And I just wondered, Dr. Singh, that the message that the medication is really more of a symptomatic thing and at best can only mask areas in your life where you may need to put effort into lasting change. That's a message that we need to give to many levels in the healthcare system. And I wondered how you felt we should best do that. Um, 
I guess, I mean, the honest answer to that would be that, you know, I, I just wish we knew and understood these medications better. Mm. So, you know, while James, I completely agree with you that many patients come and say, you know, I, I've lost count of how many times I've heard this, that it did something in the start and then it stopped acting. Yeah? So that, that is the, uh, the major narrative. But then I also hear about patients who say that, you know, they, they have remained well and every time, even though they have tried to come off it very sensibly, very slowly, often done uh, by themselves, um, they just don't seem to do that well. And I think that is what first got me interested in this whole area about discontinuation and withdrawal. Um, you know, maybe with more experience and more research, this will become clear to me. But I, I think so far, I, I just feel like we do not know enough. It's like, you know, using cancer drugs as uh, first line. We don't because we appreciate that they are pretty toxic. They are drugs that have to be used with a lot of caution. And I think that same degree of caution needs to apply to psychotropic medication rather than being used willy-nilly. I do not think that these medications are safe enough to be used the way that uh, they do. And they can sometimes create problems and create clinical pictures that can actually lead to more iatrogenic harm. So more harm from the professional in an attempt to uh, uh, relieve uh, a problem that they might have created in their uh, first uh, place. So I think for me, as a professional, that's the starting point. And I think I, I make it uh, a point to do that in every clinical interaction with the patient, in my you know, uh, communication with the GP. So I, I make a lot of song uh, dance about uh, the fact that the patient is on this medication and it has to be um, kind of given uh, due diligence that what it means to be on a toxic uh, medication and what measures are required, not only in terms of monitoring and health advice, but what is required from the patient. So just to give an example, it is not the case that I do not prescribe medication. But if I am going to prescribe somebody an atypical antipsychotic, for example, like olanzapine or cotarpine, medication that we now know without doubt that have almost, almost 100% uh, increased risk of uh, metabolic disorders like increased weight uh, gain and therefore increased cardiovascular risk. If we know that 100%, I make it a point that I have that discussion almost on its uh, itself. Hmm. And I almost ask for a commitment from the patient that if they are willing or if they want to go on this medication, this is what they will need to do in order to actually be on it. So I mean, over the years, I have had patients who have not put on any weight uh, on these medication and have been on rather minimal dose because they have just made a commitment to manage their lives, you know, lead much more active life, be much more mindful of the, what they are eating, you know, make sure that they manage stress in a way that reduces the possibility of them needing more and more medication or more than one medication in future, etc., uh, whatnot. And I guess the same needs to apply to all medication. I mean, unfortunately, my place in the system is such that I sometimes have these conversations quite late. But I mean, in some ways, I don't think there is anything as too uh, late. So I think as professionals, we we need we need to stop this habitual prescribing because I think a part of that is just not hearing, just not hearing these repeated accounts of patients saying that they had horrible side effects or they missed one dose of medication and they had this acute withdrawal. We, we just, we do not hear it. My colleagues do not believe or share the view that I do that these medications create withdrawal or severe discontinuations in terms or that it is possible that a person can have these weeks, months, years after being on medication. They do not believe it, but I do because that's what patients are telling me. Well, I can certainly attest to that from personal experience. Any conversation that I've had with my doctors about psychotropic medications has been, here is the benefit you'll get. But there was no counterbalance in terms of you may experience these adverse effects or you may have a very difficult time coming off. There almost seemed to be a tacit assumption that staying on the drugs for life was the best approach. And I didn't have enough knowledge as a patient to question that assumption at the time. And I guess those interactions are based on a relationship. And I, I think that is what makes me feel quite mindful of the responsibility, because I think it's a huge privilege to have that position where a person coming to you just by virtue of what you do professionally is going to trust you um, 
and be ready to do what you say. I mean, I mean, just imagine there is no other profession in the world that uh, comes with that uh, kind of an advantage. But I think it's an advantage that we possibly take for advantage. Um, and I think we we need to be much more humble in uh, you know in, in taking on that responsibility so that we do not. Um, um, end up harming the patients unknowingly. I agree. A person's health should be a collaboration, shouldn't it, rather than either a patient demanding or a medical professional being dogmatic about treatment. And Dr. Singh, I wanted to ask, in interviewing others for the podcast, I've heard the view that mental health needs a revolution, not an evolution. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about that, given your own experiences of the system. Um, uh, I have the completely arrived at uh, the same conclusion that, you know, making small tweaks and having, uh, you know, these little quality improvement initiatives to do this little bit uh, better is possibly not going to change things as much as uh, we need to. Hmm. And I, I completely agree that we need a completely different mindset to look at mental health. And in my opinion, I think the first thing that we need to do is look at mental health, chronic mental health uh, difficulties in the same way as we look at any other chronic mental health, uh, and, and any other chronic uh, physical health uh, issues. So looking at uh, a chronic condition of a, a of health as a result of things that have gone wrong chronically. So, I mean, these could be uh, then looked at, you know, what, what has gone wrong in terms of uh, the lifestyle or life experience or, or what kind of traumas in a pe person's life has made them vulnerable to then manifest their genetic vulnerabilities. And, you know, where, where are the weak links for this uh, person to you, to fall prey to, you know, having a particular disorder. So I think the weak link for a person might be the mental health. For another person, it might be manifest as arthritis. And uh, a third patient, it might be an autoimmune condition or an endocrine problems. But I think at the root of it, um, most chronic mental health uh, diseases, like physical health uh, diseases, are thought to uh, be, you know, uh, things that... Um, require a multi-pronged uh, approach. And um, I guess um, this is where I think, you know, when, when I see a patient with uh, mental health and I take an interest in their thyroid status or what their vitamin B12 level is or how they are eating, how much movement there is and what is the burden of stress, I think it's all relevant because those same things would affect how uh, their thyroid uh, is maintained. So me giving antidepressants can have a positive or a negative impact on uh, everything else. And for the patient, they are interested in, in their health. That's it. They are not interested in you as a specialist doing well so that they feel well mentally, but then they're not able to get out of the bed because so the patients don't see that. So I think it's, it's a very easy a model to speak to patients about because they get it you know that's what they want for them and I think unfortunately many of them think that this is how we already function and we don't um, but I think uh, professionally it's a much more difficult model to negotiate so a transformation like this would actually mean that we do away with the mind-body split mm -hmm. we look at the mind as residing in the body and look at things much more in advance than wait till symptoms manifest. So, for example, in diabetes, you know, we, we look at so when a person is gaining weight or, you know, kind of coming with, oh, with descriptions of being under a lot of stress at work or having relationship difficulties, we see that as something that could potentially manifest in 10 years into explicit diabetes and intervening now rather than, you know, what we do is, oh, your, your, uh, your, um, you know, blood glucose is uh, 0 0.4 uh, within uh, the normal. So you're all right for now, go away and just wait for it to become a problem. I think that's the same approach sometimes, unfortunately, we take for mental uh, health that, you know, you're kind of doing all right. You're, there, there aren't in a risk. Just let's wait for things to get worse. And I think that that does not make any uh, sense. So I think we have to do away with this acute care mindset and treat people uh, like this. And in terms of mental health, I think that can only happen when the mental health professionals have enough time and opportunity to have those relationships because I, I sometimes um, 
a joke with my patients and with colleagues that you know sometimes our interaction with a patients feels like an arranged marriage they barely know us uh, and yet they are expected to engage with us with this intensity you know so pushed into therapy too soon they have to meet the therapist every week whereas no pre work has gone on uh, to prepare them for that uh, stage and i think then it becomes a a torture for both the patient and the therapist because you know the patient is just trying to get used to this whole setting and trying to make sense about whether they feel safe or you know if they trust the person enough to have a relationship and then bring their vulnerability uh, to do uh, the work and i think that pre work needs to happen in having and building trusting relationship with a mental health professional that is not uh, burdened by the pressure to move you through the system and discharge you back to your gp uh, quickly but actually look at you know what if i take time with you now you are going to do better in future and you know the system does better because then you know the same patient does not get referred four times um but i think somehow the system the way the system is set up now it is all right for the patient to be referred four times a year as long as they remain within your care pathway for x number of weeks and i think that is very short sighted and it does not help uh, the patients at all and you know it, it will change so i think how the, this will manifest in terms of systemic problems that we will continue these poorly evidence based reconfigurations with financial focus in mind we will continue to do this with such rapidity because it's not working it's not working so let's try this let's try that without really paying attention that what's really is not working is something much more basic that we need to fix first I agree and it's such a refreshingly different approach to some of the frankly quite disempowering discussions that I've had in the past. Things like it's a chemical imbalance and there's nothing you can do about it, take a tablet and depend on it for life, as opposed to recognising that the power is within the individual to change their life. That's quite a different model to where we are now, isn't it? I think it is a very different model but again I think that model only works if we are engaged with the person at the right time. So I mean imagine if a person comes to me who's severely depressed who's just like completely the end of the uh, tether possibly suicide or me having a discussion about eating well or running it's going to possibly frustrate them and make them feel really misunderstood because you know i'm expecting something that's completely not at par with what they feel able to do that but i think that that is the pressure that we create on the system that when we engage with people later and later on after exhausting many of the interventions that should have been tried uh, you know much further along the line is that i think we are setting up the patient to fail uh, to fail and we are setting up ourselves uh, to fail as well i think these discussions are much better placed with the gp in the primary care and then continued and possibly were worked on further when they come to see a specialist mental uh, health uh, workers and you know i i will again reiterate the fact that you know there is so little that we know about uh, you know why in a group of patients medication seem to work and the whole thing about work can be interpreted in many ways you know maybe placebo but i mean emerging science um, is really making us question about what we know about mental health uh, in the way it's present as well as its treatment so for an example um, the role of stress or uh, the role of inflammation in mental health uh, is um, quite topical and i think one thing that people realize about ssri medication is that it seemed to have um, some impact on reducing uh, inflammation you know so is that why it's working and if we look at you know something positive and new like that with our old mindset the obvious solution to that would be oh let's give them more anti inflammatory drugs so not they, they not only are on ssri we add another drug and hope that would improve that would be the old mindset the new mindset or looking at it, uh, things in this more evolved way would be you know hang on rather that if this is what we now know that possibly a mechanism by which these medications seem to act is by reducing inflammation what are the pro inflammatory things that this patient has in its uh, um, in his uh, or her life that we could target on before we go on to drugs so you know the role of stress in increasing inflammation the role of sleep in uh, inducing uh, inflammation the role of a junk food you know standard western diet in promoting inflammation i mean these cost 
little compared to medication or you know inpatient so i think this is this is the change in the mindset that i am interested in and i try to do with my uh, patients and tell them see this does not have side effect i'm yet to come across a patient who has said that they are feeling worse by looking after themselves but i think it also puts back the ownership in the patient's hand and helps them you know at their own pace examine the areas of their life that they never thought to be problematic when they had this pill based approach so i think i feel that is how things need to uh, change and it's it's very 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 drastic to what we are doing currently it is isn't it and it would be a lovely place to move to and dr singh you mentioned earlier that resources are one of the barriers to us moving in this new direction and i wondered if you felt there were other barriers that would make it difficult to move to this multidisciplinary approach to mental health absolutely i think there are so many ego at work and i've, I've been curious about why is it so hard for people to hear uh, about an uh, a, a different uh, view and you know as i said earlier psychiatry has always struggled to recruit uh, people and one of the criticisms of um, psychiatrist are is that they are they're not real doctors <laughs> and you know while when when people say that to me i just laugh but i think there are other people for whom that might be quite significant so it does feel like a doctor when you are writing prescriptions and ordering tests and having these very concrete definitive confident uh, discussions or recommendations to patients even though they might not be based uh, in evidence all uh, the time so i think that is quite th- it's a it's a threat to the identity of uh, the profession to let go of something that it has sought solace in for so long um i think what is interesting about the history of psychiatry as compared to other specialties is that there have been voices of discontent throughout throughout and i think within the profession uh, the split sometimes manifest as psychiatrist versus psychologist where you know even within the same profession people see um uh, themselves as being on two opposite uh, sides and on the same hand there are other people who feel very comfortable about being quite pro therapy but you would have the same kind of a rigidity and lack of open mindedness about any other way to engage a patient other than uh, therapy so i'm actually critical about rigidity in any way and i'm quite mindful that you know my personal bias might be to use less medication and to be more lifestyle focused and be more relational and what could i be missing and i think the best way to do that is to listen to your patient because i think everything i have learned uh, is because of that yeah i, I still remember my first appointment as uh, a consultant psychiatrist my first patient who mentioned something about uh, you know an alternative way to deal with her bipolar my first assumption when she said that was oh it's you know she possibly didn't have bipolar in the first place you know she was i mean i'm really ashamed to say that that i assumed that you know her she's either one of those people with bipolar who's been misdiagnosed or she just you know yeah it can't be you cannot treat a uh, bipolar without medication when i went back to her notes um she was as bipolar as bipolar can be i mean whatever you make of that diagnosis so she had these classic episodes of severe um you know uh, functional uh, impairment where she was uh, manic and psychotic so she had and then in my future reviews with her i started to have a much more open mind ask her what she had been doing go away and do the research and that's what how it started for me i think the other place where you know i thought i had the great advantage of having a bit of a break from psychiatry uh, uh, to uh, to create or develop my own mindset was when i when i got the opportunity to, to actually take a year off and do a leadership and management fellowship mm-hmm. and in that fellowship i you know i got an opportunity to to look at um, uh, the evidence for you know lots of things that work and don't work in healthcare and how people contrast and i think what what really bemused me is how um especially in nhs uh, how we can be very attached to things that don't well just because that's what we are used to um it i mean i was so influenced by what i learned uh, in that year that uh, after my return and after being a part of uh, a service reconfiguration where two 
excellent clinical services were shut down because they did not make financial sense. Mm. Um, I was inspired enough to go and do a business degree. And again, I think the themes were the same. The themes were the same that in order to do well, you have to listen to your customers with an open mind and you have to listen carefully because they will tell you exactly what you need for things to work. And for me, those have been my patients. So if my patient comes and tells me, no, this, I actually felt suicidal four days after starting this medication, I no longer disregard that. I don't say that I 100% take on board everything the patient is saying, but I am much more able to hear that and keep that in mind and listen to their story in context of what they believe really happened. Because that is what led uh, me back to looking at the literature and finding out to my horror that there are numerous papers and numerous reports about antidepressants uh, having that impact. So next time when that happened in my own practice, um, unlike my colleagues, I did not say, oh, it's, it's was possibly not the medication, you know, and just kind of attributing it to the patient. And um, so I, I think it, it it has been a process. And I, I wonder how many of us within mainstream services will have those kind of experiences where they get to develop that uh, openness. But um, we have to, we have to, I think at some point, you have to stop and ask, you know, if if we if these things are really so effective, why is psychiatric morbidity increasing? Why are more people unwell if we are prescribing, you know, 60 million prescriptions a, a year? I mean, shouldn't that translate into some improvement? Like, you know, some, but you know, it, it's anything but that is true. And there are people who are saying that we are not medicating people enough and that more and more people need to be treated. And I think treated is equated with medication. And mm. um, I think uh, that's very uncreative. I think treatment uh, needs to be what the patient believes will help them. And if that's medication, so be it by having a full disclosure and informed consent. But if it's not, you know, spending that time developing that relationship to find out what the, what that could be. I think that's very important. And again, it's great to hear that there are professionals who will question the current paradigm. Dr. Singh, I wanted to go on to ask a little bit about functional medicine, which, if I'm honest, is quite a new thing for me. And I'm very excited by what I've read so far. And I wondered if you could help me understand how functional medicine contrasts to the mainstream psychiatric approach that we've been used to. Right. So um, so my, my array, again, into uh, a functional medicine model was fueled by my quest to have answers. Yeah? Um, I, I think at one point, I would say around seven years ago, I, you know, I, I had this personal and professional crisis where I thought, oh, my God, you know, I feel I'm passionate about working in mental health. But what I'm seeing is not what I can envisage myself doing for the next 30 years. And then I started to kind of create models in my own head because I'm a firm believer that I do not want to uh, belong to a group that only protests and complains about the state of affairs. I have always been very, uh, um, you know, focused on uh, solutions. So I started to create a model that, um, again, properly, possibly because of my cultural background, um, took into consideration everything I was trained in. So yes, it had medication, it had uh, therapy, it had uh, social support, but it also ha- uh, took into account a person's uh, belief, uh, their spirituality, their genetic uh, um, configuration and things, decisions that they were making on a day-to-day uh, basis. And I feel like something encomp- encompassing all of that would possibly be a better fit for uh, the long-term chronic mental health uh, problems that uh, we see. So I do not see a problem with uh, when people present in crisis and they need to ensure safety about what happens. I think we could be much better in how we do that as well. But I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about more in terms of what we do um, on a long-term basis. And that is how I stumbled upon this thing called functional medicine, which is nothing but basically good medicine. Mm -hmm. It's basically, you know, a holistic approach where you do not think, you do not dissect the patient in terms of speciality. You do not send their head to the psychiatrist and their bowels to the gastroenterologist. And their yeah, you, you do not do that. You think about, you know, what are the common pathways 
that could have led to uh, you know, the symptoms being manifested at this uh, time. So it's a it's a systems oriented approach, uh, which is I think my inclination both in terms of medicine, but I think uh, approaching healthcare in general. And um, it it is it's 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 uh, co produced with the patient. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of emphasis on kind of exploring with the patient about what is unique about their story um, that leads them to have their particular vulnerabilities. So in, for example, mental health uh, issue would be seen not only in context of what happened six months or six years ago, but in context of you know everything else that is happening in their life and how it's influencing the decisions that they are making. So if you are a single mother with two children in inner city London, um, yes, you might have come from a very deprived background, but the fact that you did not have an opportunity for education and that you have to struggle day to day to make uh, ends meet, which influences uh, your decisions about what kind of food you buy and eat, how much sleep you get, can can all be possible um, areas of uh, solution. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's, it's really a very, um, you know, it appreciates the you know, very powerful um, um, influence of lifestyle and life experiences and the environment on uh, the genetic influence um, that leads to um, um, manifestation of uh, an uh, illness. And so I got interested in it, started to explore it. And then I, I was very lucky. So I think I, I remember uh, during one of my maternity leaves, my son was a couple of months older and I, I got very excited because somebody... Uh, from America was coming and speaking quite locally. And um, that's where I was fortunate enough to cross paths with Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, who was doing exactly what I thought is the way uh, to go. And he encouraged me to get trained. And you know, I've, I've embarked on my uh, training, which I um, completed earlier this year. Um, um, so that that is functional model. So in functional um, medicine model, there there are no specialities. Mm. So everybody is a super generalist, um, and I think that that has taken a uh, that has actually definitely made me aware of the gaps in my knowledge uh, being a specialist. But I think I have a slight advantage that I come from a developing world where I had to do a lot of general medicine even while working in. Um, uh, psychiatry. So yeah, I, I think psychiatry is particularly best, uh, well-placed to integrate uh, this way of uh, thinking, because I think we, we have the basic uh, structures. I think for one thing, even though we are doing it uh, less and less now, uh, you know, there is a tradition to spend that kind of time, kind of take that long term view. I think we are missing an opportunity if we are not incorporating some of these other uh, key areas along with which uh, what we already do. And the, the the beauty of it that the patients are asking for it. So uh, South London and Maudsley have a recovery college, which is uh, co-produced by patients and uh, uh, professionals to create um, uh, courses that uh, patients uh, and staff and you know anybody uh, associated with mental health can take advantage of and i i recently met with them to explore if there would be an appetite and they you know their response was, was oh my god you know finally somebody is willing to talk about uh, medication because this is what they ask uh, repeatedly you know how to how to come off medication and you know problems with medication and every time they attend to have this discussion with their own doctor they are told you know no none of that exists just be on it be on it forever and the other thing is you know lifestyle so i think we, in psychiatry we are quite uh, we are slightly advanced in that you know lots lots of uh, lifestyle approaches like meditation, etc., are now commonplace. But I think we are still uh, thinking of them uh, as something people could possibly delve into now and then on the fringes, rather than things that are quite central, that can be quite central to your care and how powerfully it can affect how you respond to stress and therefore increase or decrease your vulnerability to having. Uh, mental health uh, issues. So I think things, they need, medication needs to go away from the center and some of these lifestyle medication need to very much be uh, top of the list. 
You make an excellent point, Dr. Singh. The territory is there for the taking, and psychiatry is ideally placed to occupy that whole person approach, rather than separately addressing the mind and the body, but only perhaps if it lessens its dependence and reliance on the biomedical approach and the use of medication. And I think it's a culture change. It will take time, but I think every interaction that you have, if you if you are reasonable, if you are not too rigid or over the top, I think uh, those are opportunities. So you know, just just last week, one of my GPs wrote to me and say. Uh, that they found my report quite ambiguous because at one hand I'm saying, okay, the patient's profile does seem to fit the definition of bipolar, but at the same time I'm supporting their decision not to be on medication and they they were they were querying that. And I think that is an opportunity. That is an opportunity for me to pick up the phone and have a discussion that, you know, it doesn't have to be either or. And yes, the person can have that awareness and yet be ready. So in this particular case, this very young patient with a family history of uh, bipolar was v- very open-minded and willing to make some really huge changes in his life. And he was asking for an opportunity to do that before starting on medication, mm. which you know evidence suggests that if he does, he's going to be on it possibly for lifetime. And I think that's a big decision at 22. And I, I was fully supportive of that. So I think in, in making those recommendations, every uh, communication to my GP ends with that I would be willing to see them as required. So you know, giving primary care the support, because I think we are asking them to do more and more and hold more risk and do. So I think to, to ask them to do something so drastically, they cannot do it without support from specialist uh, services. But on the other hand, um, you know, sometimes uh, things that is clearly seen as the GP's arena. So I know I, I, I recently had a very well-known patient presenting um, with no history of psychosis, presenting as being quite thought disordered, as in she was not making sense. And, you know, you know she was kind of, she was very, uh, seemed very confused, you know, getting quite lost, uh, you know, reporting a lot of anxiety and lots of aches, aches and pains and other uh, symptoms. And it uh, turns out that she was severely deficient in B12. Now, the GP did not think that was an area I needed to comment on. You know, they that given the patient advice about eating more chicken livers and the patient was doing that. And, you know, it was clearly communicated to me that, you know, I, the patient was sent to me for an assessment and treatment. And when I said the treatment for this would be replacing B12 adequately, um, I think that needed some negotiation uh, and explanation. So, and, you know, many times, unfortunately, my, uh, you know, advice uh, about this would be completely disregarded if it's coming from a mental health professional because it's not seen as our area of work. And whereas, you know, lots of evidence exists and, you know, every uh, medical textbook, if you open and look at the symptoms of severe B12 deficiency, you would see that, you know, anxiety, even psychosis is a well recognize uh, complications, um, you know, not to mention that if things get worse, it could lead to severe irreversible neurological uh, damage. So I think we, we have to break down barriers of communication, but possibly of mindsets where we don't feel so territorial. You know, if my GP who has seen the patient since they were born tells me that, you know, you're completely wrong about this, this is what it is. I should be open-minded enough to actually pay some attention to it. Hmm. And if something comes in the way, I think it's worth paying attention. What is it? Uh, you know, um, because, you know, often it's nothing about what uh, is being discussed, but um, ourselves and our professional identities. Well, I'm just so grateful that you and others are willing to have challenging discussions with colleagues and peers who may not be on the same page and might be very wedded to a more traditional approach. Just because something has been the accepted approach for some time, that shouldn't mean that it's not open to challenge. And uh, I guess in having these discussions, one of the things that you will hear repeatedly is about evidence. You know, Mm -hmm. what is the evidence? What is the evidence? What is the evidence? And again, you know, I will say that there was a time when that was my defense, because I I use the word defense because I think that is exactly what it is. So anything that um, a professional, a healthcare professional does not know enough about and no healthcare professional has enough time or opportunity to know everything about everything. So I think we all have gaps because, you know, that's the nature of the beast. But I think sometimes we we hide that by asking for concrete evidence. So rather than asking, has this being studied? 
we ask what is the evidence and it seems like uh, there is there is no amount of evidence that's enough for a closed mind you cannot convince people who do not want to be convinced so you know i must say that uh, even until a few years ago i would have heated arguments about evidence because um, you know I, i think the evidence that current practice is based on is not that robust but at the same time i think it completely closes down a uh, discussion about you know things that are new and emerging so i repeatedly make the point that we do not currently know enough and i think we should also ask about you know who is going to benefit from this uh, uh the evidence or research who is going to fund this research because all those things have a play I mean, i'm i'm a daughter of uh, an agricultural scientist my fa- father is a cotton uh, genetist so i learned this quite early on that um, you know what what needs to be research uh you know does not mean uh is what going to is what, um, going to be of interest uh, to everybody involved what the research that uh, ends up happening is the one that's backed up with serious money as well as uh, professional and institutional interest and i think the same applies to uh, medical uh, healthcare and pharma based model that you know we we are always going to drown in a sea of pharma based research because that's where the money is so i think to do research that actually is going to answer the questions um of uh, you know frontline clinical care are always going to be based on observations of uh, frontline uh, clinicians and i think that's why they need a voice because i mean if you look at uh, major breakthroughs uh, in medicine i think the best insights have come from people making repeated observation and then forming a question which is then research and not the other way around they have not happened within labs because when things happen within labs you come to quite superficial solution as okay you know okay this is the mechanism now let's find a drug that will do that um it's it's a very different way of thinking it is and dr singh i just wanted to ask for your personal hopes for psychiatry and how it might in future best meet the needs of those who struggle with their mental health um um i guess uh, james i mean i feel uh, quite uh, um you know unqualified to make proclamations because i i very much see myself at uh, the start of the career than towards the end i mean uh, i i think the ho- hope i have for the profession is a hope i have for myself that my professional life will be formed of meaningful interaction and opportunities where with the patient's help i am able to kind of guide them towards uh, a future that they have co-created in a way that is meaningful for them rather than in a way that makes sense uh, to me and i my hope for psychiatry is that it returns to a place of much more creativity and openness yeah some people would say that it was never created and never open but you know that that's my hope you know i i, I that's the thing i love about mental health that it's a very creative field it's it's occupied by people who are very creative and very knowledgeable and have you know there's something in them that uh, has led them to dedicate their life to doing the kind of work they do and i think we are we are losing opportunity so i hope um that you know, even the things that are on my radar these would expand and i think the answers would come from uh, the patients that's where it has always come uh, from rather than professionals so my hope for psychiatry is that it uh, can does not lose sight of what it does well and that is to have the strong relationship where we create uh, opportunities for change to uh, happen plus you know getting more creative about what might work for that individual uh, uh, patient and I, i think that will make this uh, field very exciting Thank you Dr Singh it's been such a pleasure to talk with you today and thank you for helping me understand not only some of the issues but also how the medical community could best work together in future to better support mental health we need many more like you thank you once again james thank you so much for giving me um a space on your excellent platform I'm so grateful to Dr Singh for sharing her wisdom and experience with me for the podcast and I'm sure you found the interview engaging and enlightening Madden America news and updates. On Madden America this week, Shannon Peters reports on a new study published in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry which assesses the efficacy of two trauma-informed brief psychotherapies for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder in children and adolescents who experienced a single traumatic event. 
The randomized clinical trial compared eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy and cognitive behavioral writing therapy with a waitlist control. The results of the study, conducted in the Netherlands, suggest that both EMDR and CBWT are effective treatments for childhood PTSD. The researchers sought to evaluate the efficacy of EMDR and CBWT for children ages 8 to 18 who experienced a single traumatic event and present with PTSD or sub-threshold PTSD symptoms. A total of 103 participants were recruited from seven mental health clinics in the Netherlands from 2010 to 2013 and randomly assigned to EMDR, CBWT or waitlist control. The waitlist group started either EMDR or CBWT treatment after six weeks. The researchers found both treatments yielded clinically significant reductions in child and parent reported symptoms of PTSD, anxiety, depression and behavioural problems, and negative trauma-related appraisals reported by the child. The benefits of treatment remain significant at the 3- and 12-month follow-ups. In fact, participants in the EMDR group had 100% remission at the 12-month follow-up. The authors highlight the very short amount of time participants spent in treatment, an average of fewer than 2.5 hours for EMDR and less than 4 hours for CBWT. Therefore, they suggest that for children and adolescents who experience a one-time traumatic event, even very brief treatments may be helpful. This may free up resources for children who experience multiple or complex trauma and may need additional support. The authors call for more research on effective trauma-informed psychotherapy for children who have experienced multiple traumas. Peter Simons also reports on a new study published in Psychiatric Services which examines user experiences of discontinuing psychiatric medications. The researchers found that although it is possible to withdraw from psychiatric drugs, mental health professionals were not very helpful during that process, writing... Despite numerous obstacles and severe withdrawal effects, long-term users of psychiatric drugs can stop taking them if they choose. Individuals who discontinue report that self-care and social support help, but mental health professionals could be more helpful. Clinical practice guidelines recommend that psychopharmaceutical treatments for most mental health concerns should be prescribed for a short-term effect, then discontinued. However, patients prescribed these medications often have difficulty discontinuing them due to the severe withdrawal symptoms. This current study was known as the Psychiatric Medication Discontinuation and Reduction Study, PMDR, and it is the first US survey of a large sample of longer-term users who choose to discontinue psychiatric medications. The researchers surveyed 250 participants, 64% had a diagnosis of depression, while 41% were diagnosed with bipolar disorder, 20% of the participants were diagnosed with a psychotic disorder, 76% of the participants were taking antidepressants, 56% were taking anxiolytics, and 47% were taking antipsychotics. Some participants were also taking mood stabilizers or stimulants. All participants were attempting to stop one or two prescription medications. All had been taking their medications for at least nine months, although 71% of the participants had been taking psychiatric medication for more than nine years. About one third chose to discontinue over a period of more than six months. Another third did so in one to six months, and the final third in less than one month, with half of the latter group choosing to do so cold turkey. 54% of the participants in the study were able to successfully discontinue the psychiatric medications, and the researchers found that people were generally happy with this decision, with 82% saying they were satisfied or very satisfied with their decision to discontinue. The researchers write, The experience of discontinuation was often physically and emotionally grueling. More than half of the participants rated their withdrawal symptoms as severe. The most common withdrawal symptoms in this study were changes in sleep, 80%, increased anxiety, 76%, difficulty with emotions, 73%, and sadness or tearfulness at 70%. Some additional withdrawal experiences included fatigue, flu-like symptoms, memory and concentration problems, brain zaps or neurological problems, and diarrhea or constipation. The researchers highlight that 44% of the participants experienced thoughts of suicide and 36% experienced thoughts of self-harm. 22% experienced psychosis. Only 45% of the participants considered their mental health provider helpful in the withdrawal process, although almost all were receiving professional mental health services. 
According to the authors of the study, discontinuing psychiatric medication appears to be a complicated and difficult process, although most respondents reported satisfaction with their decision. Future research should guide healthcare systems and providers to better support patient choice and self-determination regarding the use and discontinuation of psychiatric medication. That is, there is a clear need for mental health professionals to listen to the experiences of the users of these medications. Treatment providers must be better equipped to guide and support users through the experiences of discontinuation. For more on these and other news items, visit madinamerica.com. Thank you so much for listening today, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views, and updates. 